Thank you, everyone. I'm Felipe Castro, and I'm Ian Halving. Hi. We're here to talk to you about uh, Elsevier's journey from outputs to outcomes using OKR. Right? And I want you to imagine it's 1995. Okay? And you're a print publishing company founded in 1880. And it's 1995. And then this happens. So Forbes magazine, one of the most respected business writers, says, internet first victim will be Elsevier. So this is our existential threat as a company. So in 1995, Elsevier primarily a print publisher of scientific journals. Um, Forbes, and frankly many others, thought that the company was doomed. That the internet would lead to new, new incumbent, uh, incumbents and new startups coming in doing our job cheaper, quicker. And they didn't stop there. In 1998, they doubled down on their claim, and they said they haven't been able to capitalize on the internet. Now, Felipe and I are old enough to remember 1998, and uh, not many companies had capitalized on the internet there, but, but forms, they were really sticking in the knife. But, as Mark Twain said, reports of our death were greatly exaggerated. Otherwise, we'd be standing up here with a very boring talk, and you wouldn't even know what company we were talking about. So what did we do? The first wave, we survived despite Forbes' prediction. We flourished from the move from paper to digital. And that was really important. So imagine 1995, most people read scientific articles in a journal, in a magazine, on paper, in an institutional library. We changed that and moved it online. So we embraced the internet and the opportunities it brought. And we also, you know, more recently, have started to make the journey from a publisher to an analytics company. We have a huge amount of data about science, and we find that our customers and institutions and funders, they want us to help, help them make decisions, not just give them data and information. But that's not enough. Competition has never been tougher, and change really is, you know, it, it's become faster and faster. It's only intensifying. Established publishers have really got their act together. They're taking our lunch. Analytics providers want to get in on our act. And we've got the bad actors that our security teams love to talk about, makes them sound cool, trying to steal our content. Startups coming in, and some of them are disruptive. They come up with new ideas, and we have to compete with them. And of course, there's new trends. And the last challenge we see is, I think, if you're a tech organization, in a sense, we're all competing for the same talent. You know, in London, we're competing against people like Facebook and Google. In the Netherlands, we're competing against Booking.com for the same people. You, know, you need to have an engaged workforce. So that's a new area of competition. So we adopted agile techniques. This is how we made the success. Our most important product, Embrace DevOps, and it has thousands of releases per annum. It's a, it's a great platform to experiment on. We invested really heavily in um, Silicon Valley product group techniques, and we trained hundreds of people. Still not enough. So we decided we had a need for clarity. So in search of goal clarity, there was, a, there was a meeting in Berlin, top 100 managers, and I identified three main topics. The number one challenge was making sure that everyone could connect to the um, Elsevier goals. And we realized that was important, really, for, for outcomes for the company, driving better alignment, but also for the employees. And it's the number one factor for job satisfaction. You may have heard this study by Deloitte that says, you know, employees have got written down goals and shared freely. You know, they have much better job satisfaction and higher engagement. So what do we do? We set up a, a, a goal clarity team. Um, and that goal was making everyone aware of how they aligned with Elsevier's strategy. The team identified the best approach was OKR. Those who know Marty Kagan and read Inspired know that um, we'd heard all about OKR from him. It seemed the obvious way to go. So I was a member of that team, and I got in touch with Chris Jones, who was our trainer at SVPG, and said, Chris, can you put us in touch with someone who can teach us about OKR? And he said, there's only, there's only one person we, um, we worked with at that point. This was about two years ago. And luckily, it's the man who's on my left, Felipe Castro. Thank you, Ian. So we talked a little bit about the specific challenges of Elsevier. Now I want to talk a little bit about the underlying problems that probably affect every single company in this room. Right? Where does this lack of clarity come from? It comes from the very way we plan and we align. 
traditional planning starts with strategic objectives. You get a, the senior executives in the room or in an offsite, in an amazing resort, and then they come up with a series of strategic objectives. In the traditional approach, those are then cascaded down to a set of projects, often called strategic initiatives. No, if you look at every single strategic planning session done the traditional way, it ends up by discussing strategic initiatives. The challenge is, if you're on a team, delivering those projects becomes the goal. They, do, they have zero visibility into the strategy, they lose purpose, they don't have a why. Every time I see a team that's working on a project, I ask, okay, why are you working on the project? Oh, it's a priority. Okay. <laughs> and then, but I don't stop there. Okay, why is it a priority? I don't know, my boss told it, said it, so it should, must be. So if all the teams know it's, hey, it's a priority, that's the root of the lack of clarity. Because you're just telling them you have to do this thing. Why? Because I'm, a, I'm your boss and I'm telling you to do this thing, right? And we are here at a business agility conference and lots and lots and lots of companies will say, hey, we are agile, we are doing agile, but they still work in this same way. Somebody has an idea, and if that idea is big enough, there's a business case. You know that spreadsheet full of assumptions where you promise, give me $10 million and I'll give you all those benefits in a spreadsheet. And then if it's big enough, goes to a committee, they approve it, and then we start building it. And we build, and we build, and we build, and we build for several months, and we finally launch it. And success is launching, right? In the project world, if you launch it, hey, that's an amazing project. But several of those are canceled, are delayed, right? But at the end, we never measure if we actually delivered all the benefits that were promised in the business case. And it's often not the same person. Some one person writes the business case, someone else has to deliver it. And again, when I ask the teams, okay, what's the business case of this thing? We don't know, nobody gave, I don't know, right? I have to ask the committee or they don't even know what they're supposed to achieve, right? And so we have a model where there's no measurement and no learning, we only build. And the question that is missing is, did we deliver the promised benefits? So we talk about a lot about value right, in agile business agility, but if you don't measure it, how do you know you actually delivered whatever is value to you? So there's this great quote from Marty Kagan. Uh, it says that teams have little regard whether the projects or the features they're working on actually solve business problems. Progress is measured by outputs and not outcomes. So all I track is, yeah, we launched the thing. Yay, we're successful. So, but why should teams care about business problems? We're not measuring them around business problems. By the way, we're not even measuring if the project worked. So why would teams care? We don't seem to care, right? We're not measuring it, right? So people usually care about things that you tell them is important. So on time, on scope, on the budget, right? So there's this great slide from Harry Niebuhr, who used to work for Spotify. He says that the magic question is, what are you working on and why? And Niebuhr says there are three options. The first team says, we are working on this, on this because Sam said it's important. We'll be done when Sam said it's okay. Those are acceptance criteria. Have you heard of those? Right? <laughs> then there's the second team that says, we're working on it because we, we feel like it, and we'll stop it whenever we feel like it too, because hey, we're cool, right? This is a fully autonomous team, somebody didn't get the memo, right? Uh, but that's not the, the right way to use. And then there's a third option, which is we're working on this thing because we believe it's going to be important for the company because this, and it's going to move this metric, which will help company achieve that other thing. So they understand the context, they understand how you're going to measure outcomes, and instead of acceptance criteria, they have success criteria. 
right? So they, those, that, that's the team that has the clarity to understand the context, the strategy, and how they can contribute to it. And they're done when the matches have moved. So it's not about acceptance criteria, it's about success criteria. And again, Marty again, if you're only using your engineers to code, you're getting half their value. This sentence also, also applies to every other role, of course, but engineers is easier to make a compelling sentence about, right? It also applies to product managers, engineers, analytics, whatever. But that's the challenge. We spend millions and millions of dollars to bring in the best talent, and then we only get half the value because we only, we're actually not presenting them with the why, the context, we should just give them projects to build. So instead of using that old model, we're not going to do this anymore. The new way of working is to do fast iterations with frequent measurement. So we won't be doing a 12 or 18 month project without measurement, fast iterations, frequent measurement. Okay. And the best analogy I have is that in the traditional approach, we work 18 months to build a wedding cake. And when we launch it, we only try to measure if it's selling after we launch it. Sometimes we don't even measure if it's selling. Okay. In the new approach, instead of spending all that time building a wedding cake, we do cupcakes every one or two weeks. We're always selling cupcakes. And we're testing different ideas, different approaches, different hypotheses. Think about everything that you can learn from a cupcake. You can learn about the ingredients, cost of productions, flavors, market channels, market messages. There's a ton of things that you can test and learn from a cupcake before you spend all that time building a wedding cake. So let's talk a little bit about the solution. Basically, the solution we adopt is OKR, which stands for Objects and Key Results. Can I have a show of hands? Who knows what OKR is? Oh, oh everybody. Uh, <laughs> that's good. Makes my job much easier. We, we right? can stop now. Oh, sorry? We can go and sit down now. Yeah. Right? I'm sorry? <laughs> yeah, I, 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 bet, I bet I'm going to provide a few new insights, right? So. Everybody knows this, right? In OKR, we basically do three-month planning cycles, okay? And the core idea of OKR, if you're going to explain OKR in a tweet, it's a system that forces you to sit down with your team once a quarter to discuss how you're going to measure if you're succeeding, right? So the core uh, formula is this, which comes from Intel. It's called the as measured as you buy formula, right? The idea is that to have a good goal, you have to describe what you want to achieve, but also how you're going to measure it. So the crucial words are as measured by. Unless you know how you're going to measure it, you don't have a goal, just an, a desire. We're going to build the best business agility conference in the galaxy. Whoa, amazing. As measured by? What's the best? What's the leading? What's, right? So the as measured by, those are the crucial words, and that's the conversation you need to have. And that's also the best way to introduce the two OKR components. The, the objective describes what you want to achieve, and the key results how we measure if you're succeeding. Okay. So I guess everybody has seen an OKR before, right? So an example could be, or an objective could be create an awesome customer experience, and then we can have three key results that measure if we are actually succeeding in creating that experience. So in this example, the awesome customer experience would be, would mean that we increase the repurchase rate, meaning the customers are buying again from us. We are also going to increase the customer satisfaction scores, we're going to do a survey and see that number going up. And we're going to do that while maintaining the customer acquisition cost. That third result plays a crucial role of balancing your OKR and making it sustainable and healthy. If you remove that key result, you can drive wrong behaviors, you can, people can spend tons of money. So one of the reasons why you have several key results in an OKR is that you can measure different dimensions of the problem and keep it balanced, okay? So 
one of the most crucial aspects of, of OKR is that you need to focus on what you want to achieve and not simply listing your items in the backlog. Okay? So to move away from that model where we give teams projects to build, we need to be able to work with two buckets. In the first bucket, you're going to put your OKRs, the outcomes you want to achieve. Those are our success criteria. Those are metrics that are connected to value that will drive benefits and value to our customers or our company. In the second bucket, we're going to put the activities, the things that we are going to do to achieve those OKRs. Agile frameworks mostly work with activities, right? And now, now let's get, get an example of how can we do that in practice, okay? Thank you. So Science Direct um, is the gateway to Octavis content. It's where most science gets consumed on the internet. Um, and it's, it's a billion dollar business plus in itself, just one product. So it's pretty important to us. It was one of the first groups to adopt OKR um, as a result of the Goal Clarity team. And one of the things you have to understand is that OKR is really challenging. You'll read this online a lot. It's one of the most difficult things to implement I've, I've ever been involved with and you go through a learning process. So let's have a look at quick before and after. First set of OKR when I worked with the Science Direct team. It's not a bad objective, but you look at those key results there, they're not measurable, they're not outcomes, they're clearly outputs. There are probably things just taken from their backlog. This is from a more recent um, iteration. This is about a nice pithy objective about protecting Elsevier's content. We've got this idea of reducing illicit access on our systems. But also, as, as Felipe mentioned there, we've got these two support metrics looking at the problem from another dimension, stopping illicit access from X to Y, but not having too many support tickets as a result of that, and reducing capture pop-ups. For those who don't know, that these really annoying things that I'm sure we've all seen. You know, what, what's the traffic light on there? Is it the pole as well? Is it the bit where it's just in there? They're really annoying. So we don't want to show those, our customers that unless we have to. So let's have a look at the results from one example from the Science Direct team. So most important thing is, this is Rosa Julia, really a fantastic female leader at Elsevier. We've got quite a few of them. She's very inspirational. She's leading a great team. She's, she's anyone who's read Marty Kagan's recent posts, the three prerequisites for OKR, she's really got those in place. She's really, you know, the team focusing on solving user problems. They're not a feature team, absolutely not. They've got problems to solve. Each week, 20, 30 minutes spent checking in on OKRs, focusing on each OKR individually, making time for deeper dives if necessary. And OKRs are driven daily. The teams are talking about them all the time. You know, is this gonna move the needle? And they're always a topic of Rose's one-to-ones with her product team. So helping those, having clear results keep the team focused, clear dashboards, the analytics team are happier. They've got a, a smaller set of really clear key results. There's more time freed up for experimenting. So that focus on customer experience and user experiments is really helping drive that business. So the business outcomes, what's it achieved? It's great that we got Felipe in, did a great job helping sort of business change and the techniques, but what's it achieved? So user sentiment for a key new feature, this is around enhanced reading, which is a nice tool that allows you to see other things that authors written or what the collaborators have written or related articles. That went from user sentiment of 45 to 20 with really good tight experiments measured via OKRs. We had a 50% reduction in those capture pop-ups while still reducing illicit access. And you know, users hate them, I hate them. That's a great outcome for us as a business. The number of support calls. Now, if you get to, an, to a point where you're phoning an organization these days to get access to a system, that's a real no-no. Those calls went down by 40%. And importantly, I talked about the fact that we're all competing for the same tech talent these days. Employees are more engaged when they use OKR. We've seen an input, we use a tool called Office Vibe, and the, out, the, out, the outcome there from a user uh, employee ex perspective has been tangible. Most importantly, Science Direct, best in class, net promoter scored by 20 points. Most of our competitors are seeing this going below zero. We're seeing it go in exactly the right direction. This links directly to revenue for us. So it's absolutely crucial, a really great outcome. So, back to Felipe. So, so final thoughts. First of all, Adopt No Care is a journey. You have to develop several different muscles. Uh, the Science Direct team only succeeded because they set the stage. They had DevOps so they can launch things quickly so they can experiment. 
They had modern product techniques. We can, they know how to run those experiments. They had the right leadership. Uh, uh, Rose is an amazing VP who set the stage with psychological safety, and they also had support from the C-suite. Uh, but there's still a long way to go. It's always a journey. There's no end state, right? And if you want to reach us, please do so. But to learn more about OKR, just reach out to philippecarcher.com. Okay? Thank you.